Welcome back to the second episode of Cherry brought to you by our sponsor, U Financial. U Financial Group is an investment advisory and financial planning organization offered through licensed and qualified MML investors. If you're looking for a company to help plan for your future, manage your financial assets, or even estate planning, check out U Financial at ufinancialgroup.com. Now, let's head over to episode two. to go to college at Hack for my fire science degree. Okay. And um, while I was living up here, I was living at the Progress Firehouse. And, um, you know, like everybody, we're testing everywhere. You know, I was testing anywhere and everywhere that was, you know, had a test out at the time. Uh, Harrisburg actually had residency. You had to live in the city to apply. So, um, a couple of us moved in and started working on a residency and eventually after a couple years Harrisburg finally opened up and hired and um, really I just got lucky got lucky and that was that was about 17 years ago it goes by quick 17 years so you're a battalion chief right yeah young for a battalion chief very young how, how did that happen you should be a fireman <laughs> Um, well, a lot of things were changing. We were a very old department, okay. and um, unfortunately, times were changing economically, and um, things were coming. We were going to lose benefits potentially in the contract, and uh, a lot of the guys just retired to retain their benefits. And um, you know, we were a very old department, so literally over a handful of years, we lost forty to fifty percent of the department. Um, wow very old department you know you could have 20 years on and you'd be the bottom dude you would be doing dishes at night because everybody else had 30 32 years you know really promotions were fast and furious because we were just trying to fill vacancies for the longest time we didn't have all the positions filled we didn't have battalion chiefs we had captains acting as battalion chiefs so if things were normal course i would say like you know i would i would still be a fireman or Maybe, uh, you know, I'd like to be a lieutenant on the truck or something like that. But you don't get to see as much fire as you did because you're the guy on the outside, right? Well, you're running command, you're you still get to see everything just from a different perspective. But you don't, yeah, you don't get to be the guy on the inside. Yeah, you? it's the boring part of it. I mean, you, you know, it's a lot of responsibility. You got to keep everybody safe, but... Um, it's not the fun part anymore. You know, the exciting part going inside and affecting a rescue or something like that. Like, okay. you know, I'm still young enough, I wish I was doing that. So, <clears throat> speaking of rescues, I don't think I've ever asked you about this, but yeah, do you remember your first grab, what that was like? Oh yeah. Um, it was probably uh, 05 or 06. Um, just on the job or? No, well, was two or three years on the job. Well, two, two or three years. And uh, it was Uptown Fire. And um, we, uh, we were doing driver training. And uh, the call came in, we were all scrambling to get to the rigs. 
and the Uptown, of course, was there. We were actually in the Uptown doing driver training, and uh, we got there all relative, you know, to each other, pretty much on top of each other, and um, we were the third piece on scene. And the first truck that had already arrived, they were throwing ladders, setting the truck up. The engine had arrived right in front of us. They were already stretching a line. And um, it was a second floor fire, basically a bedroom fire. And uh, it was auto explosion already outside. And um, my, my partner and myself, Emmanuel, we arrived and I came off the front seat. There was only two of us on the truck. That's right, because you guys were on white. Yeah, back, back then we had, we had two guys on a truck. So um, we were on a 75 foot Mac Baker aerial scope and uh, I came off the rig, had my face piece on, I grabbed the irons and off to the races. <laughs> I just ran right in, being in a truck company, going into search and uh, ran right up the steps. We had uh, second stage regulators on those air packs at the time were face mounts, uh, mounted on our face pieces. So literally the only thing I had to do while I was running up the stairs was just click my regulator in, had my cylinder on, like moving, nothing stopping. So I get to the top of the steps, hook my regulator in, and the doorway to the left was literally fire from the floor to the up. The smoke was about a foot off the floor. As soon as I make the second floor landing and go in that bedroom, I basically kneel down. I had a thermal imaging camera and a set of irons. I try and pull my tick up to take a look around and I was on fire. That the uh, the bedroom across the hall was. You were on fire. Well, it felt like I was. Okay, it was hot. Uh, yeah, I was burning up, and the land the retractable lanyard on my tick got wrapped around my irons, and I was trying to bring it up and look around, and uh, it was just tangled up. I was getting frustrated. I was burning, and what I didn't know is basically right beside me was the victim. She was laying. The bed was right here. The victim was laying literally right beside me. I could have put my hand on her and touched her. Wow. So I'm, you know, I'm kneeling there. I was going to try and take a look with my camera, mm -hmm. and I'm burning up. And I react. My camera's tangled up in my irons. I put my irons down, put the tick down, and I started crawling. You know, when, when, when you start burning up, you just react. And, uh, I, you know, in this scenario, I screwed a lot of things up. Um, I could have controlled the door, I could have shut the door and separated myself from the fire. But, you know, you're burning up, you react. I start moving. I continued left hand search going around the room, came around to the bed, felt the bed, checked the bed, crawled across the top of the bed, and when I stepped off, I actually uh, stepped on a, the, uh, the arm or the leg of the victim laying beside the, the bed on the floor. And I wrote, like, I could feel it didn't, it didn't feel right. The hose line was just making the second floor at that time, starting to hit the fire. The captain was right there. He got the legs of the victim and we carried her outside. Um, at the time, she was um, cardiac arrest. She wasn't breathing, um, you know, her heart wasn't beating. We got her outside. EMS wasn't on scene yet. And we did CPR for about, I don't know, probably two or three, maybe one, one or two minutes we did CPR and we got, um, Good pulses back, and by the time EMS got on scene, she was breathing on her own. And uh, if I remember correctly, she lived for several, three to six months, I believe. And Did I think meter? No, no, unfortunately not. Um, but you know, it was one of those things. You know, re reported entrapment. Um, you know, we brought her out. She was in cardiac arrest. We got her back. Uh, by the time EMS got there, like I said, we had, you know, she was breathing on her own, good strong pulses, like it looked really, you know, positive. But, um, you know, that, that was the first grab and, and the, the, the takeaway that I always tell everybody about that was, you know, coming off the, the rig with your face piece on. Those 20 seconds, 15 seconds, whatever it may be, that the guys were downstairs or various stages of their, you know, their operations, mm -hmm. donning their equipment or whatever. If you're, if you're trapped in a burning building, you don't want the guys outside stopping for anything. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like you, you're in there taking your last breath, you're screaming, you're literally on fire, whatever the scenario may be. You don't want anybody stopping. Being a truck guy and searching, you gotta move quick. You know, I, I never took a set of irons again. I always ditched the ax by the front door. I just kept my Halligan with me. Um, used it as a, a brace for my hand, searching quick. Uh, if I was going to sweep a little bit, the tick, 
you know, I like the tick, but um, it's just a reference. I stopped using the damn lanyard. Um, <laughs> you know, it was oh, dude, yeah. controlling the door. Like I said, though, when, when, when you are literally feeling the heat and you're burning up, you ain't doing shit but moving. You're like, you're a rat with your tail on fire. Yeah. But I did all those things in that room by the time those guys that were literally downstairs just putting their face pieces on, um, you know, until they came upstairs and, and started assisting me or attacking the fire. You know, if it was 15 seconds, 20 seconds, whatever it was, like all that transpired in that little short period of time. And that was, you know, basically finding the victim. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, you know, a lot of, you know, older guys, you'll hear them, they, they want you to stop at the front door, do a good size up and, and look at things. And yeah. there's merit to that, but I call bullshit also. Because if you're in there, you know, taking your last breath, you don't want me doing that shit then. Let me ask you this. So I was watching uh, The Last Dance, it's a Michael Jordan documentary. <clears throat> and one part of the documentary, he talks about going into that championship game. And it, it kind of rung a bell about emergency services people because, you know, they're getting hyped up for the game in the locker room. It could be equated to, like, the crew getting hyped on the way to a confirmed entrapment with fire. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But then he talks about after, like, when you when they lose the game, going back into that locker room, what that feeling was like. You remember, like, you were talking about the Emerald Street fire. Like, what was that like going there? Knowing, like you were saying, like, they were on the phone with the woman as she was burning, and you know it was, like, shit and get time. Well, uh, the um, Emerald Street was, um, you know, we had, like, I would say we get dispatched with entrapment probably like 70% of the time. Okay. And I bet you, I swear to God, it's probably like 40 to 45% of the time there's legit people in the building. Uh, Emerald Street, there's two different fires. The lady that was on the phone with Dolphin County uh, 911 was uh, 17, 1800 block of Market Street. Oh, Market, okay. Uh, Emerald Street, that was a, a Sunday morning, if I remember correctly. Um, multiple calls, reported entrapment. And um, the grandmother was inside. It was a first floor fire, and she was trapped on the second floor with her grandchildren, if I remember the story correctly. Um, but anyway, they were trapped upstairs, and she was in, on the second floor, there was three bedrooms, a bedroom in the rear, a bathroom, bedroom in the middle, and a bedroom to the front. So when we got there, it was a well-involved fire on the first floor, and uh, people were outside, you know, screaming, you know, that they're they're in there on the second floor, and that's her bedroom. Like if, I, point. if I remember correctly from the news, like she was handing her grandkids out the window, right? Uh, yeah, yes. There was like an air conditioner in the middle, right by the stairs, yeah. and she was lowering the kids out. And, and you know, we always get stuff. You know, you, you're getting a million different stories when you get on scene and people are screaming. It was like total chaos, but you're trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together. Um, so we didn't know how many people we had. They, do it quick. The people outside were saying there could be anywhere from one to literally like 15 people inside. Tell me about what happened here. Can you speak up? Uh, sure, yeah. I was, um, I came up, I live in D.C. I came up to pick my son up for the weekend. On my way back home, I saw smoke as I was driving by. So I parked the car, jumped out, ran over to the house, and I saw this other guy over here on the side of the building pushing a big dumpster up to the building. And so I'm like, what's going on? I see smoke. And he looked up, and I looked up, and we saw three kids hanging out of the window from the top floor. So we actually uh, climbed on the air conditioner, started getting the kids down, and we handed them down to him. We got the first two, and the third one, he just jumped out of the window. I guess the smoke was getting darker and it got hotter, so he let go. And my man caught him, you know, a miraculous catch. He's over there getting treated now. But he tells me that when he got there, that was uh, the grandmother was handing him out the window. I never saw her. You know, like we dialed 911, uh, fire and everybody showed up. But still, no sight of the grandmother, so I have no idea what happened to her. So, thankfully, you know, to her credit, she, she saved all of her grandchildren, got them all out. Um, but she was overcome and she passed away in the middle bedroom on the second floor. So she gave her life to get all of those grandchildren out, yep. getting them out the window. Yep. The fire happened here on the 300 block of Emerald Street. You can see the balloons behind me showing the outpouring of support. One woman died in that fire, but her family says she saved three children. 67 year old Jackie Black lived here for more than 40 years. When the fire started on the ground floor of the house Saturday morning, her daughter Antoinette says 
Her mother searched for a way to get the three grandchildren out of the home. The fire was moving up the stairs, and that's when Jackie helped the kids ages eight, seven, and five out of an upstairs window where neighbors helped them get down. Karen, she didn't panic. She was, you know, calm getting the kids out. Um, she didn't cry. I just don't know why she didn't get out. Jackie lived here in the house with the children's grandfather. He was not home at the time Saturday morning. The family tells me some of the children suffered minor burns. However, all three of those children are out of the hospital this evening. Live in Harrisburg, Mike Straub, WGAL News 8. You know, so we are trying to get in to get her or whoever else is in there, mm -hmm. you know, and you're always going off partial information. Like I said, it's, it's tough. Very seldomly do you have rock solid information. Like there's one person, mm -hmm. they're on the second floor, they're in the third floor. Like it's never that. You got to clear the whole building. So um, we were stretching in the first floor, and the guys uh, did vent in their search, or we call it vest, um, to the front that front bedroom. People were screaming that that's her bedroom. Like that's where she would be. Mm -hmm. So they threw two ladders. They went in. Um, you can see them go in. They're searching. They're only in there for probably. 20 to 30 seconds and the front bedroom flashed. Uh, the guys were pushing on the first floor, uh, fighting the fire, and you know, some fire was in the stairwells, already going up the second floor. It was already burning. When they made the second floor bedroom, they said the top of the door was already on fire. Hmm. So when you do fest, you go in and try and, like I said, what I screwed up in the fir when my first story was controlling the door, yeah. shut the door. Uh, they couldn't do that. Uh, Part of the, the top part of the door was already burned off and bedroom doors, you know, they don't last very long. So um, they're in there looking for her and the, the room flashed and you'll see like fires coming out. It flashed over every, every window is, is fire. Mm -hmm. And the guys are bailing out um, of the windows. E-man, uh, Kyle Burton was one guy, good uh, truck guy uptown, a damn good guy. And um, Emmanuel Stout was uh, my truck partner for years. He was still on Tower One. He was the other guy. And you see, you literally see E-Man coming out. He took a little longer coming out of the building. Mm -hmm. um, Bones, Burton's nickname Bones, he dove out right away. And E-Man, you know, he was like, when, when it flashed on him, he's like, oh, Jay, he's like, everything was light. I could see, you know, because it was all smoke, yeah. you know, prior to that. And right before flashover, you're going to have good black smoke. Like, it's getting to the point where it's literally going to light it's off. Showing. So it literally is flashing. He can see everything. He's like, oh shit, I need to take a look a second. And I'm like, buddy, like it's flashing. You got two to three seconds. Like if, if that, you need to be that. diving out the window. But he was like, this dude was a bloodhound. I mean, he had the, the most saves of anybody on the job at the time. You he were had, saying earlier that this is the only time in his career he wasn't able to save somebody. Well, yeah, and find find the victim. Find I mean, he had he had twelve. If I remember correctly, he had twelve documented documented grabs in his career, and it's um, crazy. It's yeah, yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, so, but he took that second to try and look around, and obviously he was overcome. He had yeah. to dive out the window, but he was literally on fire. Um, coming out the window. Coming out the window on fire. I mean, wow. you know. But these are like that's what I want. You know, people will be like, "Oh, you're trying to kill him or something," but. You know, we took an oath to save these people. You know, you want that level of commitment. Somebody, you know, willing to fucking yeah. burn themselves. To get you. Yeah. Wow. So, obviously since that woman had passed, what was, what was the feeling like going back to this station? Obviously you're not going to go back and celebrate. You know, this, because it wasn't, a, I mean, unfortunately she perished. But you did manage to save the kids, but she perished. What's that feeling like at the station when you get back there? Yeah, you get me fucking worked up. Phew. You need a second? No, I'm, Good. I don't get like this. Okay. Um, the thing that gets me upset, obviously, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to lose anybody. Maybe but, um, you know, E-Man was what we were talking about. Yeah. Um, that was the first fire that he, he couldn't find the person. That's got a way, oh, that just... You know, way some serious. So, you know, my job now is making sure these dudes are squared away. That beep goes off. It could be three o'clock in the morning. It could be three o'clock in the afternoon. We could be sitting there eating dinner. Like you never know when it's going to happen. We have these crazy calls all the time. You know, we, if we talk about the lady on Market Street, like literally, you know, every second counts. Mm -hmm. You cannot stop. You got to be moving from beat to 
to grabbing a person. And, um, you know, that call, you know, they were committed. Um, they never got to the second bedroom where she was, unfortunately. But, um, you know, that really affected him because to the question you were asking, um, it really messed with him because that was the first one. He, he could never find a person. You know, he had calls where there was, you know, four or five little kids. They pulled literally running back and forth out of the building, pulling kids. Um, I mean, that's horrendous. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we've, we've, you know, and, and unfortunately, I got too many of them stories, you know, just myself. Yeah. You know, in 17 years, you know, I had, I grabbed four people and I haven't been doing shit. You know, I've been in the car for the last seven years, not grabbing people. Um, you know, you can easily go, I don't say easily, but if you put yourself in those positions, like E-Man, you could have 20 years on a job and have multiple grabs. Easily. Yeah. And, um, you know, but to answer your question, you know, that, that's something we all live with, you know. And what I don't want to do, you know, I don't want to have to live the rest of my life thinking, you know, we screwed up. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't, we should have done this differently. I mean, you always second guess things, but, you know, um, that's tough. What's, what's the key to getting back on the engine after a loss like that? Because like, you can't carry it with you for the rest of your career. What's yeah, I mean, you, you do. You, you do, do. But it doesn't, it doesn't stop you from yeah, no, running I mean, into the next burning building. No, I mean... At the end of the day, you know, one of the old guys, uh, you know, there's a story around the firehouse for years, like, you know, we didn't, we didn't start the fire. We can only do what we can do. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We're going there to, you know, minimize the damage as soon as we know about it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you could show up and uh, be like, oh, we, we gave it our best. Yeah. You know, but the consequences of that is if you, if you screwed up, or you didn't make sure you were as crisp as possible on your skills, throwing ladders, whatever your, your task might be, stretching a line, whatever, um, you know, the consequences are somebody could die. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's, there's nothing worse than that. Yeah. You know, so um, that's my job now. You know, and mm -hmm. I got a bunch of young guys. Being the battalion chief. Um, yeah, I mean, I need to make sure that they are ready every second you know to the best of their abilities and and obviously young guys they have lack of experience mm -hmm. you know thankfully we still go to some fires they, they need that real life experience they need to go in and, and grab a lady and and forget to cl close the door uh carry too many goddamn tools with them and not move fast enough <laughs> um you know you know what yeah. i mean they, they need to make those mistakes while doing the job to then learn from it yeah and um you know i Every single day, you know, I spend getting to know the guys. You know, I tell my guys when they bid over, like, you might not like my methods, and I hope we're friends, but at the end of the day, like, I got one goal. I need to make you a goddamn warrior. Yeah. Like, that beep goes off. I need you moving with a purpose and doing cool, calm, calculated shit. I don't need you, like, looking around like you're a lost zombie. Yeah. And, um, you know, because, like I said, people... We're not paying the price they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm.